thank you for that. And um, I don't think we need any introduction to the panel. Um, of course, we've got Eminent Brown and we've got Jamie Waring and Yuki uh, from various very, very good brands, of course. Everyone knows them very well. Uh, we're going to kick off very quickly with some questions because, of course, we had a number of we were seven quite uh, detailed questions here. Once we start opening this discussion, I think uh, we could be discussing uh, a lot of things. So I'm just going to open up the very first question, which is um, about reopening our wellness centers. And um, maybe I can pose the question to all of you um, is how have we adjusted in this uh, somewhat stickier, more regulated operation um, environment? What challenges have we, fast, have we uh, uh, faced, I beg your pardon? And um, what um, do you think we're going to be challenging in now when we get back in front of our clients around the region? Uh, Edmund, can we start with you? Yeah, no problem. So, look, I think this, this has probably been a course of, 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 of development over the last sort of six months. I think, firstly, you know, just to go back to that time in February, March, when this situation started to arise, there was a real, I'm going to say, sense of panic. There was a real urgency, right, in terms of what sort of operating protocols we need to create, what needs to be done, and, you know, the numbers of SOPs need, need to, be, to be managed and thought of and every possible scenario gone through because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of fear in terms of what it meant for us as operations, what it meant for us as consumers. And you know, I wanted to say one thing was I was really very, very touched in relation to how the industry came together during that time in order to support, to share, and um, to create you know, the SOPs and the, the items and the tools that, that really helped us. And so we, we obviously were a part of that as a group and developing you know very strong and stringent protocols and processes in order to support our operations and you know that was a obviously a time consuming element but then when they actually got to the property and started to be brought into the property trained into the property there also became a, a bit of a sense of let's call it normality in terms of what people are actually expecting and where the primary touch points are right and i think that you know as an industry we're always, we're always, we've always been hyper vigilant in terms of cleanliness we've always been yeah. hyper vigilant in terms of our guest protocols so it really was a, a value add and i think that you know, fundamentally talking about the use of masks and elements of PPE, looking at heightened cleanliness, looking at removing elements from your operations that are high touch, and really get just looking at the guest journey. And the challenges are was A, training that in and making sure it was consistently done across a large number of hotels for us, all right, number one. Um, I think number two was, you know, ensuring and explaining to our ownership, you know, in terms of reopening uh, spa wellness facilities, that it was safe to do so. But also more importantly, we could do it profitably. Um, yes. Because a lot of these protocols look, look, look to create additional cost um, in terms of that. And I think thirdly was, you know, our well-being teams, our team members who were returning to environments maybe where there was an element of fear or element of concern in relation to, to COVID and what it actually meant for them um, and how to mitigate that fear and make sure they also felt, felt safe and create the opportunity during the day where there's an, a, a increased elements of pause and increased elements of, of concern for our, for our colleagues. That's now been established. We've now got a large number of our properties open, not all of them, as you would imagine, and then some of them are opening and closing depending on different times. But there certainly is a bit more of a sensibility in terms of the approach. And that's also combined with our group work in terms of our All Safe program, in terms of our partnership with AXA, all designed to create a safe and healthy environment for our guests to come back to. Um, so I suppose for us, the challenge was that initial sort of urgency and concern but then actually turning it into something that actually become quite quite normal and then making sure we're delivering it consistently across across our operations you know yeah great i mean i think the point you make about also training the staff and getting all the consistency throughout all the the operation centers is uh, is a very significant one and the other thing also that you, you mentioned there is about cost because you know my experience definitely when i'm speaking to my clients around the region cost has been um, you know a major factor um, and the, the, the top-down pressure for low revenue numbers in the sort of, let's say, the, the primary part point of business, which is rooms, especially in, you know, resorts and places like that, you know, and then um, having additional expenses for cleaning equipment. I mean, you know, the, the amount of cleaning equipment had to be improved has been substantial investment by many, many brands. Yeah. So it's a very... It's been interesting though. 
So there's one thing I add on, but what we actually see now is quite interesting. I don't know whether our other colleagues would say the same, but you know, we, obviously we've removed a number of items in terms of the guest journey and cost points, and, and now we're delivering services in some of our regions. We're actually seeing stronger margins, which is quite an interesting, yeah. quite an interesting situation for us to be having yeah. um, in terms of what you know what our guests are anticipating and expecting. And also, I would suggest to you that the price point, there was a lot of concern in the beginning about what price point we come into the market at. In a number of our markets, particularly the United States and other parts of Europe, we maintain the same sort of price points as before. Um, but again, we've been able to run that with a slightly lower margin and, and lower cost, particularly in terms of our labor. So um, it's been an interesting period and one where we don't have all the results in yet and all the ideas in yet, but, but certainly we're going to continue monitoring that and looking what the best way to operate is. Great. Thanks very much for that. I, mean, I think it's very good input, inputs. Um, Yuki, maybe I can propose the same question to you and at the same time just welcome Zoe on board to the, the panel. Nice to see you, Zoe. So, Hi. Yuki, so what are the sort of challenges that you have found with the Oman Group um, in reopening your facilities and the new operating environments? I agree with today alone. Uh, let's say about the um, revenue and the cost and the profitability is a big challenging, absolutely. Even our business was coming back uh, dramatically and we have a lot of high, uh, the high occupancy on the resort. However, we are targeting to the domestic market, not international travelers. Of course, we need to review to the, uh, the price as well, because especially on the Asia, uh, because international business on the average rate and then domestic, uh, the market in the price is completely different. And however, um, about the expenses, uh, the elements of the expenses is the, uh, it's significantly uh, higher than before, as you, Marco, mentioned about the equipment of the cleanup and the hygiene and everything. And it must be, and a lot of uh, like disposal items would be required, but uh, because of the government request, a lot of things. So um, then uh, at the same time for the revenue side, uh, because of the we cannot the back to back in the treatment anymore, we need to clean up to the treatment rooms yeah. and also the guest room cannot, uh, uh, like the same as the guest room, we cannot do the full occupancy, it must be 50% occupancy. So that in the living, we back to the business level became be more busy than before. However, <laughs> the expenses cost is very high so this is a very uh difficult also from to the uh, owner's point of view as well because some owner have a different uh opinion about the covid 19. and then second element is challenging about experience yeah each guest have a different expectation and hygiene standards yeah so our hygiene standard is so be everything we give it and then everybody implement the training we go some guests are thinking too strict it's no needed we don't want to some guests yeah. really want to do more and more like a japanese super duper clean level so it's the uh guests and the guests have a very strong opinion for the like about the hygiene level. So this is a personally we need to adjust it. And it's, this is the same as the hotel owners as well, because some hotel owners thinking is unnecessary to that way. So that is, I think is a two uh, big elements of the challenging for at the moment. And it's interesting, isn't it? Even so, I mean, both you and Emily and Zoe have obviously, I mean, I mean everyone, everyone on the panel has, you know, a brand that's fairly global. Um, the issue is that if you look at, okay, I'm in the States at the moment and you look at what federal government are saying and what you know, state government are saying, and then you look at the UK and the changes of sort of policy between the North and then the Southwest of the UK and what's going on, even in very small areas, there's, there's different messages going on about what procedures are, or, you know, as Emily was saying, the standard operating procedures should be. And, and in some places like Hong Kong, for example, the regulations are incredibly strict. Whereas, you know, I can tell you now, I'm walking out in California here, that it's a completely different story, even though there's, you know, a, a different message. So I guess your challenge has also been about sending the same message out to all the units where you're operating in and providing not only a standard for that location, but a standard that reaches the brand standard and builds the confidence level 
your guests have in your brand. Jamie, do you have any, any comments on that sort of experience on the challenges? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I mean, it's quick doing what the guy said before, but I mean, you know, Marco, I remember you and I, we were in Bali for the Fit Summit in December, right? Who would have thought a few weeks right. after that? This would have happened, right? You know, I mean, it's kind of it, yeah, it, absolutely. it came out of the blue completely and um, you know, unknown territory for everyone. And of course, different challenge for a huge like Accor, like Elman's brand, compared to you know, a single property really like mine. But obviously, the same thing, but very different you know, in regards to challenge. And I think what's interesting is obviously, I just getting a, um, of what people need to do to mobilize uh, and actually to, to get the PR across to the customer, to the client. Um, you know, I think what was interesting to see is that I think a lot of brands initially took a slight opportunistic approach to using the SOPs and the better you're know, getting across the reassurance of safety as a unique selling point almost initially, you know, yeah. uh, and, and it was for a few months. I think I was, that was you know, slightly opportunistic, but reasonable, I guess, because people's minds, they want to know, you know, and so to be ahead of the game, head of the curve as a brand and say, look, we are, we have better standards, better safety. I think it was great. And people could ride that for a few weeks, but then obviously it becomes a qualifier. People, the, the guests, the customer, the client, it's a minimal, right? That your, your facility is, you know? Um, you know, I think we, we are kind of touched on it. So I think as an industry, we're better positioned than most because we do have these pretty stringent hygiene, you know, tests and formulas and SOPs anyway, especially in spa, you know, it's, pretty clinical right um so i think the the challenge was you know operationally you know trying to implement these things of course feasible manner so you don't kind of crucify yourself on the fixed costs of course secondly to do and uh, actually maintain some flow within the customer journey you know, because all of a sudden you're bringing these different kind of steps which you know the the, the sequencing of wellness and spa is really important so actually when you throw different things it kill the experience you have to really get that through and a very different challenge from a big brand like Echo with all the multiple different you know verticals to a smaller smaller or single property but still around the same subject and things so all these things and then so the PR across this, this is kind of we're pushing forward and safe okay so that's the beginning but then actually making sure that you're still you're still providing an attractive experience you know uh, and then the final point you know as the guys mentioned is a basic feasibility because you know, it's tough. I mean, it, quite often we know a lot of spas are struggling to break even anyway before this, depending on locations, yeah. you know, the, the kind of fighting for, and then especially in the Western territories, the margins really tight. Anyway. Then you're throwing in these different kind of sequences and the different um, the protocols to make sure you can implement what's required once you've deciphered what you need to do as well. <laughs> so it's all these things. And I think now we're kind of, we feel like, you know, I think we've got passed through this now. I think it's a now for most operations. Um, but obviously we're not out of the woods. And in fact, in Europe, you know, I was talking to Ellen before we started this call, it's, you know, Europe are now expecting the second wave and further shuts downs, shutdowns. And, you know, I think we were in for a bit of a ride, you know, before. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're saying there too, is very, very important about the, the guest experience because actually the protocols to give people uh, confidence in the cleansiness is very um, unintimate, if that's actually the right word, whereas normally the service is very intimate. You know, the idea is, you know, if, if you're in a spa, it's a lot of it's about an experience, it's about touch experience, which is exactly what, you know, the protocols against COVID-19 is actually trying to reduce, you know, this uh, social distancing, actually exactly. cleansiness, not touching people directly. So there's uh, all this, this, uh, protective for gear, et cetera, et cetera. So it is, I think it's a massive challenge to keep that. I think the two things I get from that is the costs and actually retaining the expected experience in a way that it becomes, you know, a brand standard and it's still in line with the expectations of the customer. Exactly. Um, very, very good points. Very good points. Really interesting. Thanks very much, Gus. So I'm just gonna move on to the next question. And the next question is what unique innovation have you been able to implement in your operations that could stay with you past COVID? Um, maybe I could start with Zoe on that question. Would you like to kick it off? Hi, everyone. So in terms 
um, unique innovations. Um, something that I'd like to touch upon is with minor we were quite fortunate that pre-covid we'd actually started some unique projects uh, focusing on preventative and more in line with medical clinics now in the stage when covid happened like a lot of hotel groups around the world we stopped projects we put projects on hold and we delayed a lot of our openings however what we decided to do is we decided to move forward with these medical collaborations and what we found has been really interesting is whereas our spas our regular spas have been struggling for some of the reasons we've just explained you know the additional costs pricing structures have to change you know you know, achieving the experience is obviously a struggle when you're doing it in an environment that's, you know, a lot more clinical. Um, but with our clinical collaborations, we've actually found there has been a big demand for these type of services. And even though you could say it's a more of a niche market because of the price point, people are willing to invest in their health and really find preventative care. So that was a market that we were already exploring, but now it's actually really solidified that we are moving forward in the right direction. So I think something positive that will come from COVID is that there will be, you know, a lot of people and a lot of communities wanting to focus on health, on preventative measures, and willing to, to invest in that. Now, of course, we need to remember wellness is for everyone. Wellness isn't just for people willing to spend, you know, X amount of thousands of dollars on these things. So what we decided to do is rather than just doing all the all singing and dancing, for example, wellness resort, which we have done, we've broken it down into different categories where you can still achieve preventative wellness in a very very small space for example one of the clinics we just opened last month is actually only 36 square meters so it's very very small it's achieving very good revenue but then we have other centers that for example will be 700 square meters so i think it's interesting how we can now play around with space um, you don't need a lot of space um, and we've actually proved that one of the clinics that we've just opened. So I think for us in particular, but also I think globally, an area that we can all tap into, um, regardless of space, regardless of budgets, we can tap into that more preventative aspect and it can be fused very nicely with also traditional spas because don't get me wrong right? we don't want to move away from that there is still very much a need for that traditional holistic experience but you can also fuse it with a more medical approach mm -hmm. i mean i think the point you bring up about space is really interesting because i know i i think that the industry in the last two decades have gone through very different opinions on how how many treatment rooms you should have how many members you should have on a gym you know depending on the size and spending on the number of keys etc etc i think that there's been lots and lots of changes in that area and and i think that's to do with lots of things i think that obviously there's a, a different service being provided as the, as the industry's matured you know we've done lots of different types of treatments in the treatment rooms so the room suddenly had to have a shower because we started going to maybe you know, mud mud sort of treatments or maybe even seaweed treatments, you know, whereas we weren't doing that really in the beginning, it was very much more straightforward massage. So it's got more, more sort of like um, sophisticated, so more, more equipment's needed. The same has gone into the gym area where functional equipment needs more operable space, you know, um, there's, there, hotels become bigger so you've got to have more so i think space a really interesting one and and you know i'd be interested to hear you know from you know the other guys on, on around the panel uh, how are you dealing with space planning going forward as an innovation it, uh, are you thinking about your spaces are you thinking about offering wellness services outside the typical four walls of either the spa or or the gym Emlyn? I think it's definitely a consideration. I think firstly, you know, if you're asking what, what the, the, the current climate is in terms of this is going back to the fundamental question, do we do a spa and wellbeing space in a property or don't we? Right? And that when you go back to that question mark, is it going to be a viable 
uh, element that we create ROI, number one. And I think that's a question that's now going to be asked a lot stronger from our ownership and from our, from our operating teams in terms of you know, whether we do it or not, number one. Then number two is a question of the space and the size. And I think there is a, definitely a, an opportunity to look at that. Obviously, right now during COVID, people are talking about space and more expansion and, and more you know, gym facilities and gym design. Right? I think the jury is still out. No, I, I fundamentally believe we are going to return to a more communal exercise experience, and, I, and I'm, I'm certainly banking on that. I think that you know, we are communal animals after all. We are the most social of social of, 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 of animals in the kingdom. So you know, I think we want, to, we want to get back to that, but a little bit too early to make big judgments. But certainly in terms of numbers of numbers of treatment rooms, you know, how, how reception and guest journeys work, whether our thermal facilities can be revenue generating or, or amenities is a big question mark. Whether we do size of pools and size of not pools and there is definitely an opportunity i think to to rationalize but also maintain the same sort of standards and, and guest experience but maybe within a smaller footprint you know and it's about being as so is mentioned innovative in terms of that thought process the, the, the push and the question comes from our owners saying well how can we create and, 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 and generate roi just touching on the fitness area a lot of opportunity within the hotel industry to make the fitness experience far stronger to make it more revenue generating to learn from you know, there's high value, low price point models whereby, you know, access and membership is, is maybe more online driven. It's, it's more flexible, um, creating more flexibility in pricing to, to drive uh, membership into those sort of spaces that fundamentally in most hotels is, is an amenity that's often underused. You know, um, that's certainly an, in, an innovation and in area we're looking at with one of our brands, the Pullman, whereby the exercise experience is really going to become central to the overall brand experience. So, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of, of, of items there. A little bit too early to make concrete decision, you know, in, in terms of this. But certainly the thought process within Accor is always to look to maximize our, our space and maximize what we do in terms of returns and ask some serious questions about elements like grooming and hairstyling, which were, became sort of, you know, predominant within our, within our spa build because we felt that that one or two guests may want to have it. But we can use that and service that from externals, you know, and, and in much more, much more innovative ways. Um, and, and I think that's the sort of the direction we're looking to looking to go in, you know. Yeah, and I think that the point that you make here about you know how do you engage with the user, not only just on an ROI, which is a, an obvious thing, but also in long term or return business, or how do you from from one hotel the next have your your you know someone who's as a visit say in say Hong Kong and then goes to Singapore, how do you retain that loyalty? Um, through these, through these, you know, these, these, these wellness provisions, because that's the sort of the trend at the moment, and being able to sort of link that, um, and I think there's great opportunities with digital applications today that we see, you know, been really de developed in the last seven months, because it's the only contact point people have got now is to go online, and uh, and how we how we're going to capitalise on that communication system now is going to be. Of value, I think, because when we're welcoming people back into the hotels and welcome, welcoming people back in the resorts, they want continuity of their experiences. So, you know, the people that are going to come flooding hopefully back into our businesses is going to be those ones that we are still in contact with when they're not visiting us, because they still want, they they still feel that they're wanted, that they're valued, and I and I think that uh, especially in in our industries, are very it's very valuable. So yeah, they're fantastic. Okay, so um, maybe I can just move on to another question. Um, how are you further rebuilding consumer confidence in returning to your facilities and properties? We sort of touched upon this a little bit, but um, one of the things that I do find is a real advantage in this sort of segment of business is that I do think the reputation of, let's say, um, well, we've said it already, the spa facilities and the wellness facilities or gym facilities in a hospitality environment have probably got more reputation for cleanliness than you would have your sort of, you know, typical gym. Um, I'm not saying that against the gyms, I'm just saying that, that, that I think that's a perception that's probably relevant to hospitality in the sense of uh, a lot of the brands have, you know, established, uh, you know, cleanliness based on bedrooms, which obviously have to be exceptionally clean to have uh, new guests confident. Is there anything that you're working on at the moment that you think is worth sharing on how you're building confidence with your guests? Uh, Jamie? 
Uh, <clears throat> look, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I'm going to go back to the previous question a little bit in this answer, because I think, you know, we will force a look at our business model, right? our fundamental purpose in life has been shaken to the core mm. for everyone. I mean, there's some winners in this, we know this, right? But for most hospitality, fitness, wellness providers, their business model is just massive challenges overnight and um most will do well to survive is the kind of truth right so you know i think we have that you know you know and in addition to that i think you know to to go into the next point you know the digital applications digital forms the use of uh, websites is um accelerated five years within five months they say you know people are forced you know to a digital and people who haven't really used digital platforms previously are rushing to you know solutions because that's the only means for the fit especially for the fitness industry right the fitness industry where the shop is shut the bricks and mortar building is shut what do you do i mean you go digital right all these people have these plans well yeah we'll go digital at some stage <laughs> well like overnight you know cranking out different kind of options it's great and it, i mean obviously i'm sure more more time to think you know the, the end but it's forces issue um, to create these hybrid solutions, you know, bricks and mortar, we, we've all seen how vulnerable this is, you know, and based on what, based yeah. on what happens going forward, we don't know how long this will be for, we don't know if it will come back in some other form, but the truth is now, if you own bricks and mortar buildings only, you see the kind of vulnerability to this, right? So you have to kind of look at other revenue streams, really take a dive into your fundamental business models and your, your forecasts and your assumptions, because, they're not working right now based on this current situation. So we're all pivoting, you know, trying to find different opportunities. And there are many opportunities, you know, of course there really is. And there'll be lots of winners. And actually everything's changed, but still I have to go back and say, some things are still true. All that the best product, you know, will win in the end anyway, because that's kind of in business anyway, right? If you're, if you're providing the kind of consistent experience, value for money, uh, you know, uh, day in, day out, you know, you'll, you'll win anyway because there's pent up demand absolutely in hospitality. You know, wherever you try and travel, um, Australia right now, and I tried to get away for a few days, everywhere's full. So there's pent up demand absolutely and people wanting to travel. The difference is it's more domestic, of course. And you know, the, the, the question, the debate is, will that be the future of our businesses that are domestic, community-based mm. businesses, you know? And I think that's something we'll probably go into during this kind of this. But, you know, to, but to answer your question, I think, you know, consumer confidence in your question was, well, I mean, I think all the things we spoke about, but I think it's, you know, the, all that really, I think, is creating your business model to make sure that you have an it, to make sure you can survive through this, you know, uh, to provide the service quality your guests come, as you will anyway, because we're all scrambling for the innovations anyway, and we're all trying to have the kind of unique selling points against our competitors. This is just sharp. This is just bring it to a real head where you have to be even better than you thought you had to be previously, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, it's a very good point, you know, about, you know, making sure that you're, you stick to your core product or services, making sure that you're building confidence on what you're good at doing I mean, and, and what your primary core business is. And actually, very interesting enough, um, just listening to some of the other presentations earlier on today. Um, you know, the idea of getting back to basics, you know, we're, we're living in a very complex world at the moment where can we really rely on all the information that we're hearing? And the answer is probably not, because this is so unique, this pandemic, this, the, the way we're reacting to it is so unusual that actually, you know, we just don't know enough, you know, and the information is going to change from one day to another. So. Actually, it's interesting what you're saying is, you know, making sure that you get your product right first is, is also part of the foundation of getting people's confidence back, which is, is a very good point. Yeah, thank you for that. Yuki, do you have anything to share on, on the idea of building some confidence back into your market? I don't think we can hear you, Yuki. I'm sorry. <laughs> Now you can hear me? Yes, there you are. Um, yes, yes I agree best. with uh, Dennis because um, let's say that was very interesting. We were a little bit nervous when we reopened to the uh, spa 
all over the hotel. Everybody was nervous. This guest would be coming back. Maybe guests wanted to have a contact with us anymore because it's zero social distance on the massage of most of them. <laughs> but actually, we are busy than before. So the reason was, I think we established the relationship with guests and we are the like industry providing to the well-being lifestyle offering. So guests believing our staff know something how to be a healthier, how we are doing to the uh, well established to the wellness life. So actually it gets more interactions than before because guests are asking to the question because they believe we know something than other people. So that, that was a very interesting point. So then uh, let's say we sell to, uh, let's say skincare product and we starting a supplement. We sell a lot of them before because guest believing. So that will be helping to the, uh, establish us the uh, confident why the guest will be bring back. Then now is more, it's a big opportunity uh, than before how we thinking because I think somebody said it, um, wellness, healthy lifestyle will not establish one day. You go to the five day detox, you will be healthy. That's not true. Everybody knows that you need to walk every day. <laughs> you need to do continuation. So let's say uh, like we have a urban spa, uh, urban wellness center like Tokyo is open to the New York. We are focused on the more daily walking and then they can go to the uh, resort one time a year or two times a year to uh, establish, uh, not let's say establish, it's more upgrading or resetting to the annual level, then continuation. So once we uh, concrete um, the relationship and the trust with the guest, our business will be a more and bigger because once they thinking this person knows something, they will follow to the all advice. That's why we are very confident. Also guests feel very confident to come back to the, these people because we know that. So it's, a, uh, I think it's important to, we have the, we keep educating to the, our staff to, I mean, new, technologies, new educations, everything. This is how I feel. Oh, that's great. I think that's a real refreshing point of view because typically when we're talking about COVID, it's all about social distancing and cleaning and not touching this and that. And then what you're saying here is actually your, your market trusts you as being an expert in wellness. So when there's uh, something that, um, makes people feel vulnerable in their wellness they come to you for advice yeah, it and i think that's a very great link between what jamie was saying about keeping your product right and your service mm -hmm. right and obviously you know you know what your experience yeah because is. actually why we decided to move on the supplement but it was a natural uh, progress because we wanted to provide it in my health care in home but in the same time we had actually a lot of phone call from the guests when they could not come to uh, our spa they're asking to specific yes. about the uh, specialist and they're asking what they're supposed to do what should, which supplement I should yeah. take it, which kind of like herbs I should. Did we lose Yuki? No, Yuki, I think we may have lost you in your last, last sentence. Okay, well, I'm, actually that was actually a really great link into the next question. Hopefully we will regain connection with Yuki. Um, but the, the connection I see there was, uh, the next question is, how has recent consumer behavior and buying patterns influenced the thinking that you are having for the next six to 12 months? And obviously Yuki is pertaining to the idea that they, you know, they have an inward bound calls about helping them at home. Um, Zoe, any thoughts on and how, how you're sort of planning for the future based on the, um, the purchase patterns of your, your guests at the moment? Well, I think like a lot of hotel groups, uh, the biggest adjustment um, is the fact that we're all catering for the domestic markets. And I think that 
foreseeable yes. future is definitely going to be the pattern. So especially for a lot of our hotels where we are predominantly driven by an international market, we have found that our spending pattern has completely changed. Um, also is obviously in line with the fact of the electricity, the economy outlook. You know, a lot of people are facing redundancies, unfortunately, salary cuts. So I do think, especially for our market, that is deemed not necessarily, uh, you know, a necessity, often it's considered a luxury, that people are quite cautious how and when they spend their money. Uh, and we definitely feel, especially more so in Thailand, with a lot of our spas where, you know, Thailand, the, the land of smart hospitality, I mean, you can have very, very good uh, treatment um, that, you know, the prices are very, very lift. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm in Okinawa and then just the heating a typhoon right now. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> This is a true global conference. I'm sorry. Isn't it? This panel is from every corner of the world. So, uh, yeah, we are finding well, we hope you're okay. um, our pricing strategy um, has changed significantly. And what we are focusing on, and I think a lot of hotels will have to do more and more, is the idea of packages. So, you know, for your domestic market, it's a package that includes spa, it includes FMB, it includes room. Now, a lot of the students mm. that always has a challenge because then how is that revenue, you know, particularly allocated to each department? But I think, you know, big picture, if these hotels want to survive, it's ultimately about, you know, trying to achieve as many room nights and occupancy as possible. And we're finding to do that, we have to package it all together in, you know, very appealing price versus trying to segment and put it so everyone gets the piece of the pie now. It's challenging, um, but I think definitely right now for the domestic market, um, it's something that we're all going to have to to look at and focus on for sure. Well, it's an impressive point, isn't it? Because you know potentially what that could mean is that you know the core business, which has always been rooms, is now actually going to be well. We've got to attract the domestic yeah. market who actually don't necessarily need the room. You know, they're here now for the staycation. You know, they want the experience now of what can be provided in, in the wider services of hospitality, like you say, going beyond our conversation, obviously, from wellness, but to F&B and other elements of experience selling, you know, um, which is a really interesting, you know, concept to be going. You're almost, in a way, you know, turning the, the sort of like the business model upside down on, on hospitality and saying, okay, it was rooms and it filtered downwards. Now let's turn this up. And then the other way around is what experience will actual funnel into the rooms, which is, I, Emily, how do you feel? Is that is a new type of concept of buying purchase? Is that a new sort of thing that you're experiencing with that call? It's interesting because, you know, talking about consumer behavior, we recently got a little bit of research back from our, let's call it our summer like, increase in business from June until, until, until September. And, you know, about 45% of our customers were saying that, asked would they use spa wellness and wellbeing facilities while they were on property? And there was still a fear factor in terms of using them, right? Then the same 45% said, well, I wouldn't book the hotel unless those places were actually open, right? A very strange situation. It's a bit like the old health club days when you build a swimming pool. People want to pay the premium membership for it, but they never actually use a swimming pool. Now, put that into into sort of context. But yes, absolutely. I think that you know we can't just be focusing on getting heads on beds. It's got to be an experiential element, and that's what people are going to be buying and purchasing. Right? That type of release and that type of opportunity to decompress from either confinement or more strict conditions in terms of city locations. Now, that lends itself really, really well to, to resort locations and those places within, um, you know, within, within great nature or by the coast. That's, for example, our Talassa therapy operations here in France did exceptionally well during the summertime. And a bit of a resurgence in, in interest from that from a, from a younger guest profile and, 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 and clientele. Um, but certainly, I believe that you know, we're going to see, I think, longer term or medium, medium to longer term, what I would call a super acceleration of the thought process about the health or the ownership of your own health, right? And I think from a hospitality point of view, 
there's probably three key areas you can get into. I think number one, we as a group, or we as an industry can tackle nutrition in a much, much better way, right? And the idea of, you know, the, the health corner in, on a buffet when they existed is now going to become much more central. You know, the, the understanding of and the sophistication of people's understanding of nutrition is really there. And I think we can definitely look to work with in a stronger way with our food and beverage offerings to attract that type of clientele who wants to maintain that health while we're on the road. I think secondly, the exercise experience, not just the fitness gym, but the outdoor experience, the idea of regenerative travel, the idea of movement is an opportunity for us to embrace in a number of our locations. And I think thirdly, you know, mindfulness, the idea of the, sort of the, the mental decompress or the support that can be provided through either courses or apps or whatever types of learning to help people deal with, with anxiety and stress that this situation has caused is an opportunity that we can also have in, in many different variants across the board. You know, our team worked very hard over the last sort of six to 12 months to launch our emotional well-being program within Raffles which is coming to market very, very soon. It's a fantastic piece of work that they, that they delivered um, by my colleagues. And that tackles a number of those areas, the nutritional element, the mental health element, the spa well-being ritual element, to bring it all together within luxury hospitality. And I think that's the sort of direction that we, we can definitely embrace as we look to sort of pivot towards what is a, you know, a newer normal and a newer way of operating. Mm. So, I mean, that, that bridges very nice is the next question about how we reposition our businesses to cope actually with everything above that we've spoken about and that that what you're saying at raffles there is a very good indication of the sort of development i wouldn't you know maybe it's a, the, the idea of repositioning is a little bit extreme but it's it's about how you refine the business under circumstances that have like digital speeded things up a little bit to a different sort of delivery right well the digital thing yeah. we, haven't, we haven't really touched on and i think that is also i think where we're going to have to move towards i wouldn't want to see you know digital completely replace the exercise experience i think that people when they come to a property will still be looking for that that physical element as well but it is, it is an opportunity that we need to have you know and the raffles program of emotional well-being which my colleague Lindsay worked very very hard on um, not only touches on that, but also our design elements, how we design properties, right, in terms of the future and what, how we create a much more well-being and wellness journey from our arrival reception to our guest room experience to the, the understanding about how we really you know, support and implement elements like sleep, how we make people feel better, you know, in, the, in these sort of spaces. That's pretty much the direction I think it's going to go, what consumers are going to be demanding. Yeah. No, it's very, very interesting. Jamie, do you have any uh, any thoughts on the idea of potential repositioning to cope with what we're doing? Yeah, I mean, look, we, um, of course, one of the opportunities through this whole crisis is that, or, or the fact is that, obviously, people who previously who weren't thinking of wellness are now. <laughs> because, you know, the reality is that people, you know, we're all going through a really disturbing time, and the challenge we all have, it hasn't landed yet. We don't know what the new normal is. We're all guessing and, you know, what this is. So we're still kind of recreate and understand what's the new market without really understanding what the final position is and that we probably will never know the final position but so it's quite a tricky thing to do but again the opportunity is that everyone is you know for the first time for some people you know are really accepting the fact that and again it's a cliche but wealth is wealth and all that you know and it really is and i you know the, yeah. i think what the step is seen and i don't want to make this a political kind of discussion but you know we've had so many of our civil rights Groups during the times that people, I think, are now understanding that they have to take responsibility. We have to take responsibility for our own health, because if governments might be wrongly have shut down certain things, of course, to try and help and keep you. Fact is, the more you give up your kind of your kind of personal responsibility to you know to bodies outside yourself, you could say the more vulnerable you are. Right, so you have to really take health back to yourself and understand what that means. So this is really going into the opportunity that we all have in our industry because to reposition, you know, I think we, even if it's a domestic market for hotels and resorts, I think the, you know, the, the, the let's say the destination spa model is basically, you have your programs of wellness first and the rooms, start, right? It's back to front from a normal hotel. Yeah. A normal hotel, you buy the room, and when you're there, you may have spa treatments or you may use a gym. Uh, the model in the destination spa or retreat or whatever we want to call it is the other way around anyway meaning that you book your program yes, based right. on what you're trying to achieve detox weight loss fitness whatever that is 
and then the room supports that. So I think that's going to accelerate this discussion for a lot of a lot of the brands, you know, because even if it's a domestic market, you can actually the opportunity to present a um, set of programs which answers the kind of the questions people need answering is what can I do to you know in simple means or ways that, that I can understand to have the biggest impact on my health. And Emlyn touched on you know nutrition. Absolutely. There's one thing we all should do is eat well because the amount of poison we eat, realize it, sugar content, you know, carbohydrates, don't know this, you know, then sleep, you know, and then all the other things, you know, movement. These are very simple kind of concepts to understand that people need help with this. And I think this is the opportunity we have is to present our industry, um, you know, present these models, which people, can, even the domestic audience, you know, you provide this. Um, and you know, I think it would be interesting to see how the big brands really out um, as we're in China with much easier. We have a big property, but it's one property. And the China, you know, the Chinese are very interesting market. I mean, they have thousands of years of you know ancient wisdom with traditional Chinese medicine. But the normal wellness we're talking is new to that market, so there's a big education. They accelerate quickly because for some of the things even before COVID, you know, the mental mental health issues, the working crazy hours to study 18 hours a day, you know, the top students, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's moving that way anyway. So, and what we see in China is that people, there's a real you know, drive for people to really take more responsibility and really step into that. And, uh, and I think that's the opportunity for our industry. No, and that, that's a really good point. You know, the idea that, you know, we have to take accountability for our own actions that, uh, you know, supports our, our wellness desires rather than expecting that it will happen. I mean, and, and I think that, you know, if you look at what's happening, we're very, very, you know, fortunate to be in this industry in a real, in a real sense, right? We're at the forefront of, um, of providing um environments for people to access wellness or certain activities of which i know i've been to the the, the, the you know many many events uh, over the years uh, based on wellness and whether it's come from a spa background or, or a fitness background or even uh, you know a practitioner background you know we've we found it very difficult to actually um identify the true meaning of wellness and, and and it's interesting there's lots of institutions out there going, no we know how to, it, it's not it's not going to be the same definition for everybody but the, the the fact that people now are so much more open to the idea of the importance of different elements to wellness like you say like eminence of nutrition's one you know the the physical side of it of, you know you know, relaxing after a hard, you know, a long journey or a hard day by a nice massage or a treatment. There's combinations of things that are now starting to come out that are forming a really um, elevated experience. And I think that you're right. The opportunity we have now to elevate this experience to a point where it's really meaningful for everybody's life. Again, goes back to some comments earlier on by um, other people who were presenting earlier on this morning was, one of the most important elements now that they're learning in these tough times is the balance between family and work because now we work, work from home you know and it's been great to spend so much time with the family typically i travel every week in apac and i've actually spent the last seven months at home um, you know because i can't travel um so it's interesting to see that i think that you know maybe post covid we will retain some of this experience and this education and hopefully use it to make the environment better for us working forward um so great really good points there so let's have a look at another question um now we've talked about lots of innovation we've talked about repositioning we've talked about um how we're sort of trying to adjust to different demands and different markets but what are, what are you considering investing in now as a business um maybe it's to recover a bit of the you know the sort of potential sort of uh, challenges we've had um, obviously you know you know we understand those straight away um, but maybe it's also about actually having learned from these sort of experiences that you may be thinking that it's going to be for your particular brand a good move in the right direction um, Emlyn you were just you know, referring to the Fairmont concept um, but other ideas so where 
where where this where's this learning pattern sort of making you make decisions in investing for the future? Could I start with Zoe? I mentioned in the beginning one of the first questions. Can't hear you. Yeah. yeah. So I mentioned in the beginning the first question was obviously for minor pre COVID, we were investing in preventative medical space which we will continue uh, further. We will obviously open these, these six clinics, which as I said, vary in size, um, but de definitely that's the area that we are going to focus and develop within the spa of wellness space. Um, as a company overall, digital 100%, I think this is something that all hotel groups could always do better in. Um, not only in this space, it's always a question as well as return on investment on digital. So it's not always easy to get across the line, but I definitely think we've all learned that little lessons in what you can do with digital. I mean, especially when, when COVID happened, I mean, through digital, through, through the internet, we could still exercise, we could still eat healthy. I mean, the amount of creativity and innovation that we did during COVID, I think would make uh, a much earlier, you know, going back to Basically, trying to that I think yes, we will move forward with digital, um, and I think also training. I mean, look, as hotels, I think we all have been trained, but I think something that's been key, uh, especially for us in terms of confidence to our guests, is making sure our teams and staff members are confident. Because I think in the beginning, I think for all of us, you know, there was a lot of uh, insecurity. We were all unsure about what was happening. And there was a lot of fear in everybody. So I think investing in your team and your staff, um, especially in terms of wellness, I think if your team are healthy, if they're mentally well and we focus on that and they have the confidence, that then trains to your guests you to have confidence. So training, digital, Great. I mean, I, I think you're right. Education, you know, I mean, even Yuki, you were talking about that earlier on, weren't you, Yuki, about how you, you were trying to, you know, improve the training based on the new policies and things like that. I mean, are you looking now? What are you, are you uh, making specific investments in education, Yuki? Yes. It is. Uh, we are uh, planning to educate the, uh, to the, our staff, not only to about the manual things. It's we would like to uh, working with some specific uh, the doctors, <laughs> professors, because I need to educate to the internally first, not only because the, we have a lot of inquiries to the guests. So we need to be uh, educate. Uh, we need to we need to be able to educate the guests. So that's why we need to educate ourselves first. Uh, I just put on the uh, some other question you put in all the end together one things I think about the um, investment is a very interesting question you're asking because we are the pathfinder of the world right now because everybody looking for the health everybody looking for a healthier life and well-being life and we are putting the, our focus now we can be optimizing to the, our health spa industry 20 years ago starting to reacting oh i'm so tired i'm going to have a massage that was 20 years ago and now we are talking about that as zoe said is the prevention and we are talking about proactive actions so we are living to industry our industry already doing the proactive not reactive anymore and then as james said it about the, the we are overwriting the rules exactly we are creating a destination for the hotels so that's why they're uh, we are making the package from to the mindfulness and the healthcare and the medical doctors as you know we have uh, this all type of the things and then same uh, same octave. so actually i would like to say that how much we're sending to the rooms because of the package it's the incredibly uh, let's say dramatically improvement year by year Yuki's frozen again, Marco. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Let's say for instance, it seems coming. It seems seems coming just as she's about to uh, finish with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Maybe just to look at it from investment from the ACOR point of view, we touched on the idea of exercise and fitness. So from a digital point of view, number one, but also the ideas and learnings of sort of call it high value, low price business models, which allows us to drive in uh, group exercise. And thirdly, the boutique exercise concept, because let's be very frank, hotels, fitness areas are pretty bland. There's a fantastic opportunity to embrace a lot of the modern elements that are happening within fitness. Um, into our hotels, and that's certainly a direction we're taking with our Pullman brand and our, and our soon to launch partnerships. I think, secondly, from our side, when we say digital, we're also going to CRM and the, the use and maximization of technology within SPA, which we know fundamentally a lot of owners and, and our operating teams are not as strong on. If we're going to be developing a day SPA business and an external outreach business, we better, better get good at CRM and use of software and the understanding about online presence and SEO maximization and all those types of things. There's got to be a significant investment in that education part as well to educate our people to be more commercial, to really understand the business model and, and how it can how it can be better. I think two other points that I mean I'm interested in personally. One is the idea of recovery. Uh, looking at some operations in the UK, for example, like Belgravia Cryo, which is a great combination going on from what Zoe was mentioning of you know, LED facial through to uh, use of Normatec and our ideas of hyperice to cryo chamber to HBOT therapy. That sort of combination of recovery, all driven by the idea of reducing inflammation, right? And the idea of inflammation in the body is a really interesting topic. I think lastly, from our side, how can we create a spa wellbeing experience that has to look at the labor as a, as a, as a labor margin, right? Because we can't be having five or six different mini departments in a seven treatment room spa with 18 to 20 heads. Um, particularly within Western areas. So looking at things like day entry for a thermal experience, and I think thermal bathing, despite the challenges that are happening now with COVID, will definitely come to the fore in terms of the regenerative and the, the, the supported elements it creates for, for health and well-being. So that's some of the areas that we're looking at from a business perspective for the, for the future. And I think what, you know, this DRM concept that you brought up is very interesting because yeah, typically, in hospitality, we're so focused on the service element, aren't we? And the CRM, which is, um, you know, fundamentally a business administration process, which needs to come to the forefront. And like you said, having, you know, our, our, our staff on, you know, on the front line, a lot more commercially aware um, to balance out the level of service is, is you know, going to be so important going forward because, um, I mean, I, you know, Prior to working at Techno Gym, I was, you know, consulting on developing hospitality projects and et cetera, which include very large spas. I mean, you know, some of the spa sizes that we were looking in sort of like, you know, in the beginning of 2000, 2005, and 2008, you know, were just, we got a little bit too big. We got all a bit expite, excited about this sort of like new concept and, uh, and, and, and rightly, as you say, you know, now we've got to look at the P&L. And I think that, you know, we, we need to re redevelop what that P&L really, truly means, not only um, as, a, as a business unit, as a hospitality, but also to the people who are working in there, who, who actually are, you know, are incentivized to work in those environments. And like you said, having them more com commercially astute is, is a very good point indeed. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank, uh, thanks for joining again, I'm Yuki. So sorry. sorry about your technical issues. Uh, but, no, uh, I'm, so I'm sure the pun, the, the pun will come in a moment. Um, I actually just seen the, t the clock and um, I'm just waiting to see whether there's going to be any open questions from uh, anyone who is enjoying this panel. I can't see any coming through just for the moment. Um, so I'm going to actually just ask the very last question. Um, the future of wellness, you, well, it's probably never been as so exciting or potentially, you know, the opportunities like Jamie, you were mentioning you know, a moment ago, um, you know, we find we, we face a really bright future. What's really, let's, let's finish on a really high positive note, what's really exciting you about the future of where we sit in the industry? Jamie, let's start from you and then we'll, we'll go around the whole panel. Very quick, because I know we're coming to the end of the time. But look, um, it is an amazing opportunity now to 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 support in their journey, right? Their wellness journey, which they really need right now. And, you know, not to contradict that, I think brands need to not, of course, 
take the opportunity without being over opportunistic, which means they may run after opportunities which aren't aligned to their brand values. So they need to be careful on that. It can't be too stretch, too much of a stretch away from their foundation. Having said that, these are pivots to make sure you can offer these fundamental um, solutions which people are looking for. You know, and I think this is you know, for us as an industry. I think we're going to catapult ourselves, accelerate much quicker than we were going to, based on COVID. So I think there are massive opportunities, providing people can actually create integrated solutions, integ that holistically lives, very meaningful, simple, powerful way, which will make it empower them to live the, the best life. Right, that's what we are industry is about, and I think that that's the opportunity I see. Great. Thanks very much. Zoe? I think um, that's Can't hear you. Yeah. yeah. So I think with as much as there's yep. been obviously challenges with COVID, I think definitely COVID has put wellness on the map for sure. I think this is just the beginning. I think the potential of what we can achieve as an industry is, I mean, it's here. We can, but we've got to be, I think, Remember that wellness is for all. So we've got to be able to, it's not just about, for example, okay, I'm doing a lot of medical projects and they're obviously more expensive, but also you can do the traditional holistic. So I think it's about addressing, you know, your market, your customer, what you're trying to achieve. Um, I don't think always you can be everything for everyone. Um, so you've really got to look at, you know, your location, your guests and what they want to achieve. But 100% wellness is for all, for sure. Great. Absolutely agree. Uh, and you yes, I would like to say that this COVID-19 to, uh, as, let's say, extend it to the speed of the, our industry growth, let's say. This is how I feel it. And then this is, of course, we ha that's why we have a big, big responsibility to do the guiding to the next levels in the more healthcare, like prevention, medicine, proactive, and everything. We, we, we must be responsible because we're working to the leader of the, this industry. And then second things, I think this is already changed to the, uh, I think that we are, became be a key player on the business. Before we was not essential, now we can be essential because we have a many uh, new business, uh, like a new business partners, let's say about uh, the new investment for the properties and everything. All, most of the prop, uh, like property owners, we asking why they choose the AMA. Of course, brand. The second reason is because of the wellness. So all the next project, I mean, our project wellness right. is a huge amount of the space, everything, because they, they are looking for that. So already, I think the people start to realize it. So that's why this is the most exciting for us. Fantastic, thank you. Emily? Three areas, Emily. I think, just to conclude, Jamie, the idea of ownership of health is an interesting one for us. It's gonna lead to an acceleration of that interest, in that demand and understanding of ownership from a health and well-being point of view. Therefore, participation in movement, exercise, nutrition is all gonna to start to increase. I think from an industry point of view, what excites me is the fact it's a blank page again. You know, this is a real reset if you actually think about it in terms of what we're trying to do. And so the opportunity to press the reset button and look at the model for our, for our businesses, let's say from a hotel spa industry or for the fitness in a hotel industry or for more wellness destination driven resort industries, for me, nothing's off, off the table. And I think that the, you know, what is a very, not being critical of my, of my hotel colleagues, what's been a very entrenched mindset in terms of certain things, is now a lot going to be a lot more open, a lot more open to changing food and beverage menus, a lot more open to promoting and sales and marketing and using wellness as a, at the forefront of doing all those things. And therefore, the demand and the voice will hopefully allow us to reposition that. I think lastly, from a commercial point of view, an absolute need and, and a, an opportunity to look at our business model, our business case, and make it more efficient, make it more appropriate for our guests and make it more appropriate from an owner's perspective. And they're the exciting things I think we have ahead. I think that all those points that everyone on the panel uh, in the last question made are very, very valuable. And I, for one, really look forward to working with every one of you uh, in order to deliver this to what's more important and has been said already in the summit today is the end user's experience. If we're focused truly on providing a wellness solution for everybody, 
Um, in whatever segment it may be, um, we will be looking at ways of doing that in a unique way, which will mean that we'll need to be innovative and we need to be thinking broadly, like you're saying, Emlyn, um, and also including all these very focused ideas on, on delivering a specific product to the market, which is going to be around guests experience. And it's going to be an exciting time. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to Blair and the team for allowing us to be here today. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm looking forward to getting on the football scores for you later, Emily, to find out who's won what. <laughs> Thank you for that scare earlier on. It was great. Thanks, everybody. Everyone, stay well. Thanks, Thanks everyone.